Hello, everyone. Very good morning to you all. Um, welcome to ATA Insights webinars. My name is Sheetal Shamdasani. I'm actually the director uh, for the events in, in energy storage in Spain. Um, today, we're actually going to be talking about fire safety designing and energy storage fire detection systems. Um, this webinar is sponsored by Wersila. Before we get into the session, I want to remind you this session is recorded. So um, do uh, know that we're going to be sending you all of the materials as soon as we're done um, so that you can rewatch it again. Um, so don't be shy. Do ask questions. You can use the tab uh, right below for the Q&A um, to, uh, well, to address all of your questions to, to our, our speakers today. Um, I would very much like to know where you are listening to us from today. Um, I'm based in Madrid, Spain. Uh, what about yourselves? I, I see a lot of the, a lot of you are in the US. Let us know in the chat on the right, where are you from and what company? Uh, we would love to hear from you. Um, okay, so without further ado, let me uh, present you to Michel Said Navid. He's the fire protection engineer at Varsilla, and he will be the moderator for today. So Michel, the floor is yours and yeah, hope you'll enjoy the session today. Can you hear me? Are we good? Yep, we can hear you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the introduction. My name is Michelle Asai Naveed. I am Wurzel's fire protection engineer. Uh, with me, we have a great round of panelists for uh, you all to... One second. Can you see my screen? Yep, we're good. Awesome. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in to this webinar. Today uh, we'll be discussing topics on battery energy storage systems, fire detection, and features for safe global projects around the world with industry experts. My name is Michelle Saad Navid. I am your host. I am Warsaw's fire protection engineer. I hold a Bachelor of Fire Protection Engineering from the University of Maryland College Park. And then I did my master's from Northeastern University in Energy Systems Engineering. Uh, within Wartzilla, I am leading product uh, compliance projects related to energy storage, fire testing, and other R&D efforts. Uh, I personally come from a utility industry background. I was an FPE for a major utility in the Northeast. And uh, aside from that, I'm also a subject matter expertise leading fire protection design and code compliance reviews for several energy storage projects. With me, I have my colleague, Christopher Groves. Uh, turn it over to him for him to introduce himself. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Groves. I'm a product manager for Wurzilla Energy Storage. I hold a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. Um, in my previous role, I led hardware engineering projects for ESS uh, fire and safety compliance testing and R&D. Uh, I am also the spokesperson on NFPA's ESRC, which is um, a group uh, for energy storage research. Um, so we're re supporting industry re relevant fire protection issues um, in research needs. Uh, I also have experience um, for both government and automotive sectors. Thank you, Chris. And our final panelist, Mr. Paul Hayes from Hiller. Go ahead, Paul. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, uh, Wardzilla, for involving me in this great topic. Um, I see a lot of names that I've had the honor of working with over the years. So hopefully we'll give you guys some new information. As if, if we've talked before, you know, I spend an awful lot of time talking about battery safety. I am an NFPA principal member and I lead a number of the task groups, including the alarm and detection for new codes and updates within uh, A55. So I've spent an awful lot of time working with AHJs, designers, manufacturers to hopefully implement best practices and look at the, the critical safety systems within lithium ion. Again, thank you and uh, welcome everybody. Paul, talk to us about Hiller. Who is so I, I trying to, to, to not go down the, the sales path here, but uh, Hiller is a company of about uh, half a billion dollars. We have offices across the U.S. Uh, we have a lot of 
remote locations and areas that we can work on for battery storage. Uh, we spend a lot of time across the whole U.S. with a lot of uh, well-seasoned and educated individuals, project managers, and we will continue to, to grow our footprint and look forward to working with uh, you guys on the call. So please ask questions and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Chris. And a little bit of introduction regarding Wartzilla. Wartzilla is the third, third world's largest energy storage integrator with a pipeline of three and a half gigawatts and seven and a half gigawatt hours of energy storage across six continents where we provide a comprehensive, fully integrated energy solutions, including hardware, energy management, software, and life cycle solutions. With a very fundamental commitment to safety, Wurzel is proud to have a 100% safety record for our group of quantum energy storage systems. With that, I think we can start the topic. So, Paul, Chris, tell me, what is battery fire safety and why does it matter? Let's start with you, Paul. Ah, so, so flipping it on me there. So, battery safety. Um, a lot of what we deal with in the world, unfortunately, is a little bit of politics at the moment that uh, there is this little bit of fear of lithium ion batteries. We've seen they have the videos in the world. So what we need to do as an industry and what I think we're looking at is how do we convince the, the, the public and where are we taking these safety steps within the code best practices so that the understanding is that the risk, especially for what we do, large scale batteries, um, is minimal, um, but we do see the the uh, the approach. We want to keep our first responders safe. We want to keep our people safe. A couple of things that I uh, push very hard is one, I don't want to be in the news, and two, I don't want anybody hurt. So that safety matters, and we just need to, as a new technology, let the industry know what measures are being implemented and what uh, manufacturers are doing to improve the overall safety of this. And it's an ongoing uh, approach. It's an ongoing effort by really the whole industry. So that's what I look at for uh, battery safety. Yeah, absolutely. And Chris, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think, you know, as a manufacturer, Wartzell has a fundamental uh, need to ensure that our product meets um, all of the applicable codes um, related to safety of our systems. As a global integrator, um, we not only need to focus on you know just the U.S. We have to look at all of the relevant codes for the localized um, systems. So, for example, uh, these you know fire detection systems. While U.S. may follow NFPA codes, the U.K. Uh, follows EN EN 54. There's specific codes in Australia, and every country is a little bit different on on what codes they adopt. Yeah, definitely. And I think let's dive a little deeper at a system level. What are the differences between addressable and conventional systems? Yeah, so uh, I like you. Thank yeah. you. Um, so a conventional fire alarm system is uh, configured using analog zones. So having like detectors wired in series, um, that fire alarm system is not able to pinpoint the activating fire alarm device. Um, the other option for out there is an addressable fire alarm system. So that uses um, digital signals and each device has given a unique address um, that can convey different information. So the fire alarm itself will be able to pinpoint the activating alarm device or provide additional information, for example, on the triple signal. Is it um, auxiliary power loss, battery power loss? Um, is it a short circuit, et cetera? And, and Paul, from your experience, I, I know you're, uh, you work with many distributors in the fire alarm space. Uh, what are the pros and cons? And why would a client pick one of the systems versus the other? So back to that initial question on what is fire safety. Um, the, the code is still ev uh, evolving. The technology is still evolving. It's not always obvious what the failure mode is on a battery because we have to deal with the explosion and fire. Most of the time, from a fire perspective, it's it's obvious. We can see containers on fire. A fire department can deal with it. It's a question of um, what happens if we get into a failure mode that doesn't initially evolve fire. 
So when I look at a conventional system or an addressable system, how am I getting information to the appropriate first responders that are going to have to deal with that? So a conventional system is going to limit the amount of information. We're not necessarily going to see that it's a fire condition or a gas condition or a potentially explosive condition. When we get into the addressable system, we can pinpoint, okay, we've got a gas detector in unit 15 on row 20 that is in a state of alarm. So that information can be pushed to the first responder. Now, a little bit of the pros and cons is, you know, an addressable system is more expensive at a container level than a conventional system. But when you start looking at where the codes are going, uh, aggregating a signal from an addressable network is a lot cheaper to the to the tune of you know a tenth of the cost of trying to aggregate systems across the site. We get you know a couple of containers. It's not too bad. You start getting hundreds of containers. All of a sudden, we're trying to put a lot of wire and power uh, across the site. So, from the standpoint, you know an addressable system is always going to be preferable. There is some discussion in the code that should we require it. Uh, it's still up for debate at the moment, but it, it obviously will cut your cost from a site perspective, but it will increase your cost at a container level perspective. Yeah, and uh, and Chris, I just want to ask you a follow-up question to this. In your experience as a product manager, have you seen customers and clients heading towards the addressable route, or what what is their preference? Yes, good, good question. Um, so... Uh, Wurzilla did release an addressable system um, early this year, uh, both available in the U.S. and um, the IEC market. Um, we have found that uh, a lot of the major utilities and customers have gone this addressable route. As Paul mentioned, once you get into these very large sites, it's much easier to manage all that information with an addressable system, and it gives that peace of mind to first responders. They know what the initiating device is, what the, the trouble or alarm signal is, and how to better approach or manage the incident. Yeah, definitely. Okay, let's shift towards more at a detection level. Let's step aside from the system level. Let's talk about detection. What options are there for fire and gas detection systems for energy storage? Chris? Yeah, so um, at a container level, um, you obviously have smoke detectors. Um, you can have a combination smoke heat detector, smoke heat CO. Um, there's also gas detectors inside units. Um, and even down to the module level, we've seen gas detection. Um, at a site level, um, you can look at a radiant or thermal imaging detector um, overlooking a, a large number of units. Definitely. And Paul, I'm going to piggyback this again and again with your experience in the industry. There's a lot of options for detection. What recommendation do you give you, to your clients when looking at battery energy storage systems? So it, it's a matter of risk. Okay, where are we locating? And I realize sometimes that may not always be obvious, um, but there, there's a difference in, okay, one being located right next to a daycare versus one being located uh, out in the middle of the desert. You know, theoretically, we look at a uh, let it fail, let it uh, consume itself. I like that terminology that the unit's going to go up. So as such, we're not looking for a whole lot other than, OK, do we have a high gas situation? So when we look at fire, most of the time when batteries are going to go off, your smoke's going to go off at the same time, probably your heat, probably your gas. They're all going to get hit at one time very quickly when they get over overcome. So the radiant, the, the thermal imaging are generally outside the container and may be a little bit slower, but the primary piece of equipment I'm going to look for is that gas detector. Do we have high levels of gas in the container? Can we communicate that to the first responder? So we said it may not always be obvious. It creates that white smoke from a battery failure that either hasn't ignited or um, def uh, deflagration. So we want to know that we've got a high gas situation, that there may be an unknown. We want to approach judiciously if needed. Ideally, stay out, stay away. You've got the information. An asset is not worth the light. So it's really about communicating that, that data to a non-fire condition uh, to the front to let the first responders know. Obviously, 
you know, when we get to a, a failed condition, there may be some things that we got to look at. So the more information, the better. So if we've got that gas detector, we've got that smoke, that heat provides information. If we get into a um, an exposure location, then I'm probably going to say you really need, you know, a pre-warning condition, something tied to uh, BMS as a backup. BMS is your most critical piece of equipment for detection, honestly, but we may look at something as a precondition failure, your BMS, then you've got a post-condition failure, your gas detector, uh, potentially some type of suppression, your gas, uh, your high-level gas detector, and then what are the, what is your final mitigation measures? So that's why I look at the difference between fire and gas. I really want to know about that explosion hazard. The codes have been shifting that way. The other thing to look at when we look at gas detector is, are you providing a suppression system? Is there some type of impact? Uh, if we're detecting hydrogen, we release a some type of suppression. Is it going to affect, you, affect your gas detection's ability to detect that gas? So that's a critical piece. I think there will be some code language coming out that's going to ask that that be evaluated next cycle. Long answer. Yeah, absolutely. And well said, actually. <laughs> There's a lot of upcoming changes in the codes, uh, and we're, uh, from Ward Solis' perspective, we're staying on top of it. I know uh, Chris spoke at the recent NSPA convention extensively on this topic, but in, in terms of new products, I know there's a lot of people coming into this market space, advertising and uh, boasting about their product. But Paul, do you see any new products in the fire detection space that are innovative for battery applications and are market ready? I, I do. I think people are starting to recognize that this is a pretty significant market and there's a lot of opportunities. I've seen a lot of the manufacturers start to put products in the marketplace. And, and I don't have any one particular and I don't want to, to sell a particular product, but we're seeing that pre-failure condition detection. We're seeing some additional inerting systems. We're seeing some quick detection. We're looking at options that Different types of detection may be used for NFPA 69 systems, not just fundamentally a gas detector, may not respond as fast. So there are some systems that are being put into place for uh, releasing of, uh, of the gas, trying to exhaust it through NFPA 69. I, I see like four or five manufacturers right now in the marketplace that are putting product in. From my perspective right now, I haven't seen the large scale testing in all of them. So I think there's gonna be a little bit of an evolution over the next six to 12 months to see what really is working. Hopefully it's not gonna be in a, you know, a, a failed condition in the, the real world that we get some data in the labs that people are doing large scale burn tests. And in doing such, we can see how these particular systems respond and work through it. But I, I think we're gonna see a lot of changes uh, in the marketplace, and hopefully some better uh, products that'll that'll help drive safety overall. Yeah, and in terms of large scale testing, I know Wartsila from our side, we've done several this year, and uh, counting for next year. Uh, Chris, what about you? Do you know of any products in the fire detection space that are innovative for our products? Yeah. Um... I would say that uh, a lot of these fire alarm vendors have uh, a Modbus gateway. So what that uh, system does is it takes the data um, from the panel. Uh, it, it can be connected to say an EMS system uh, for remote viewing. A lot of these sites are, are remote unmanned sites. So it allows the operator visualization of what alarms are getting. Um, you can get faster and more accurate communication either through e ethernet or 5G communication. Uh, it can send SMS alerts to site personnel or operators. Um, as I mentioned, you can see real time uh, status of the panel. Uh, it also allows remote troubleshooting or programming of the panel by the fire alarm vendor. Um, you can have faster commissioning um, because you can access the panel through an app while walking the site. So instead of multiple uh, people commissioning, you can have a single person. Uh, it also allows for digital inspection reports uh, to be stored on the cloud. So uh, easily accessible from an AHJ or an insurer. Thank you, yeah, exactly. So now let's shift to, uh, 
to, towards a response uh, discussion. So when it comes to response, everyone knows across the globe that NSC 855 is the go-to code and standard regarding energy storage. Uh, and for those of you who do not know, NSC 855 is a standard for the installation of stationary energy storage. It provides a bit of insight into mitigating risk, helping to ensure all installations are performed appropriately, uh, taking into account vital life safety considerations. Uh, and the standard also offers a comprehensive criteria for fire protection of energy storage systems. And it just keeps getting better in the next revision after revision. I know Paul and Chris have been a part of that technical committee. And uh, it, is, it is interesting to be a part of, that's to say the least. <laughs> uh, but the standard overall is the baseline of where many of us, like Wardzilla integrators, start with to approach AHJ's authority having jurisdictions and future customers. But in NSPA 855, there is a reference to Fire Command Center. Can you explain to us uh, what, what that is, Chris? Yeah, so uh, a Fire Command Center is a, a single dedicated location where the entirety of the site information can be displayed or provided to the fire service. Um, so the location should be uh, in at the site where the firefighters can safely observe uh, through the duration of the event. So you may see these cabinets or enclosures uh, located outside or just near the gate or entrance of the site. Um, ideally, inside of that system, uh, you would not only have, say, a network denunciator to the fire alarm panel, uh, you could have your emergency response plans, you can have your SDS sheets, or, or a number of other items. And all those documents you mentioned, emergency response plans, site design guides, these also stem from NFP 865, and which is uh, widely asked nowadays as, as energy storage projects take uh, into the market. But is, this the, is, for, is the fire command center the same thing as a first responder station? Paul, what, are, what do you think? Yes, uh, so, uh, I'm sorry, did you say Paul or Chris? Both. Let's start with you. Go ahead, Chris. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, that terminology has been used a number of times, um, this first responder station, um, but um, it's not preferred as the um, other emergency personnel, the, the fire department, uh, so like P police, EMS, um, which may not need access to this uh, fire command center. So uh, we'd like to see the industry shift from first responder station to fire command center. So, so it, good point, Chris. Um, it, it tends to be a common knowledge in the industry, but there's not a defined first responder station. But it, we're trying to, to shift so that it actually re references 72 and reflects what the industry has. Um, but there is still a lot of use. So I think that term ended up in the annex as a crossover so that people can say, well, what, what is the difference between the two? But ultimately, I think this is probably one of the most important pieces of equipment we can provide it is that aggregation. It does provide communication. It keeps the first responders out. Ideally, we don't want them entering sites or jeopardizing uh, life and safety. So by pushing that to the front, it provides a pathway for keeping those guys with available information, but not necessarily allowing them to go in and engage. So... We'll see where that ends up, but I think the first responders, again, mentioned some changes in the, the code and the aggregation for the next cycle. And I, I would always encourage, if you haven't done so, go look at the next cycle. Go see what it says about detection out there, because ideally um, we're trying to address best practices. And uh, that's always an interesting discussion, as you mentioned, Michelle, uh, being involved in that code. Code committee is uh, what what really is the best practice that helps overall. But that that's kind of my thoughts on the first responder. Got it. Thank you. And how are these sites typically monitored? Uh, what is the code required? Chris, I'm going to start with you from a, from an integrator perspective. Yes. Yeah, so um, as I mentioned before, uh, typically your your fire detection system or gas detection system would be connected to your, say, BMS or EMS system. Um, additionally, um, you would have, so that this would be monitored normally offsite by an operations station. Um, additionally, you can have this gate, Modbus gateway, 
um, that would allow communication to say a central monitoring service um, normally provided by a um, fire alarm vendor. And, and Paul, from a code perspective, what is required? What do you preach to your clients? So we look at an, uh, an FPA UL listed 864 system. And sometimes we get requests to run all the fire systems through the BMS. But there's a lot of requirements under 864 that have survivability, uh, backup power, uh, loss of power, you know, loss of communication that's not necessarily built into the BMS. There's nothing wrong with utilizing the BMS to take some of this data back to the ROC uh, remote operating center. But the, the rest of it should be through the control system, through the network, and then we either put it on a dialer, uh, something that communicates through the internet, depending upon security issues, and tied back to 72, for the most part, as a communication detection system for communication. We would expect it to be monitored 24-7. Uh, even from the standpoint of if a system goes offline for whatever reason, um, that we still are communicating with the fire department. So nothing nothing um, beats the phone call to the fire department going, hey, guys, our system's being tested this week. We're going to be offline. But ideally, that dialer communication, loss of power, loss of uh, you know communication, fire, explosion, whatever it may be, would all go through a, a listed 864 compliance system. Got it. And when it comes to energy storage projects, who do we typically engage? Uh, Chris, I'll take you first from an integrated perspective. Who is involved? Who is brought to the table? Um, normally, I mean, that's a combination of both the developer, um, the local AHJ, uh, and reviewing what their their concerns are. Yeah, so Michelle, I would probably say that the you know first and often through a developer, through organization, through the manufacturer and the EPC if they're there, that that call made to the fire department say, hey guys, we're going to be here, we're coming. I don't have all the answers and everything for you right now, but we want to introduce ourselves. We expect to meet code, apply best practices. Uh, here's the product, and we'll be in touch in a month or two to to give you some more detail. But it starts that conversation because uh, there is that political side, that little bit of fear that that fire marshals trying to get a good grip on it, and uh, you know training on the backside is critical there too. But I think that earlier and often with a engaged SME whoever that may be, to meet with your fire department and start the conversation. Gotcha. And you mentioned fear. Uh, when, it, when it comes to batteries and fear, I'm, I'm sure that's pretty common in the news. But Chris, from your perspective, how does that engagement between AHJ go? I know you've dealt with AHJs in the past. And how does that interaction usually go? Yeah, so... Um... You know, it really depends on the level of knowledge of that AHJ. Uh, what we found is there are certain areas of the country or world where uh, battery energy storage systems are more prevalent. Uh, they're familiar with the systems and their designs, what the hazards are. Um, but there are, you know, a lot of these other AHJs that aren't knowledgeable of best systems. So really, it becomes an education um, piece for for us uh, as a manufacturer, you know, we're very well aware of our systems, how they're designed. Uh, we recommend our developers bring us in early and often with those discussions with AHJs to look at what their concerns are. Are they valid? Um, do we have a mitigation means for them? Um, and then, you know, we go through uh, obviously the system design, but then we also follow that up. Uh, with a comprehensive emergency response plan and training provided either locally or virtually um, to that AHJ. So, Michelle, it, it is and a team effort, very much so. It is, definitely. And I know, Paul, you've also had experience with the AHJ. Uh, tell, us the, tell us about your interactions. Have they been pleasant? What have you been seeing? You, um, it, it, it runs the spectrum. So California is very much engaged, uh, has a lot of knowledgeable AHJs, but I would also say we've dealt with some Californias that are looking at the, um, I, I use the term, a zombie apocalypse. 
Okay, what is what is the end result that we're looking at here? Can we define it? Can we bound it? Because ultimately we can't go down the road of what if. We could play that game forever. And, and it's difficult to try to bound the scenarios to something that's reasonably anticipated uh, to manage it until the uh, appropriate SME gets on site to make decisions on what the next step. We run into jurisdictions in other states that really haven't adopted the code yet. And uh, what do we, that's a big one that we can probably talk about, is how do we move forward in some of the states that are working on 2015, 2018 IFC that doesn't have much batteries information and a lot of systems are going in that may or may not be compliant. Uh, it's hard to say, but I would still encourage in those jurisdictions to engage the fire marshal, let them know what's coming, do the training. The fire marshal may say, no problem. You get into places like New York City and they're gonna they're gonna put you through the ringer to make sure everything because we've got exposures, which which is appropriate. So that there's a broad spectrum. I would also encourage um, you know, we talked about a little bit of A55, but the IFC and CFC and some of the other states, Arizona are all moving towards adopting 855. So the language should be consistent, but you know, how do we take a state that's working on 2015 or 2018 and apply best practices when they're saying, well, you're code compliant, but you may not be best practices compliant. And we all know that we're gonna get into some augmentation down the road too, which will be interesting to see what type of technologies exist in three to five years when we're adding additional battery containers and what the code's gonna say that may require upgrades to those systems at that time. Yeah, and uh, coming from a utility perspective, I know where I previously worked, we were the AHJ. We just kept everyone else in the loop. Or we had our own safety standards and stringent requirements we held, uh, we followed. Uh, but it comes to the 855, what can we expect in the upcoming changes? Can you talk about that a little more? Yeah, ab absolutely. I kind of mentioned if you get an opportunity, go under and look at next edition and you can see all the recommendations. There's a number of them that were put in as committee inputs. We're not really sure what we want to do with it. We want industry input. So I would love to you know, have some input from the public. They're going to be published here. I think we're going to vote on it in in April, uh, not even uh, maybe February, and we'll go out for public comment. So please, if you get the opportunity to do so, one of the probably the biggest change we're looking at is defining critical systems. They're originally under most of the codes. It was defined as single fault condition. Okay, you have a battery fail. That's one fault. You have a HVAC system or exhausting system fail. That's one fault. The change in the code is saying that under a fail condition of a battery, the crystal critical systems have to function. Same thing you see under an FPA 72 that says, okay, if we lose power, we got to have battery backup. We got to have an operational time to get people out safety, safely. So those critical systems, the gas detection, the combustible gas reduction concentration system, I think I got that backwards, but anyway, um, those systems have to function in a failed environment. So they are being pulled from that single fault condition to a standalone evaluation. I think that's going to significantly change how we look at the perspective because a big part of that is what is the battery backup, which is ironic. Here we are in a field of batteries, and I'm trying to figure out how to provide battery backup to our safety systems. Somebody figures that out, give, give me a piece of that. I want a little of that commission. But I think that's going to be a big one coming down the road is how do we function those critical safeties? It's going to affect the battery backup. It's going to affect the gas concentration systems. So that's a big one. Um, aggregation of data. It's probably going to be cleaned up a little bit better. Survivability. What are we looking at for failed systems in a gas condition versus fire? Some of the things we're putting in there is where your gas systems have to function up until it catches fire. At that point, all bets are off. Uh, possibly, as we talked a little earlier, addressable requirements under discussion. Power requirements. So a lot of those things are going to change and hopefully not significantly, but providing clarity of what we think needs to be out there. Thank you, Paul. And Chris, how do you see this in 
impacting wood. So uh, what steps are we taking to be proactive? Yeah, so uh, we as a manufacturer, we are engaged um, uh, with the code um, standards. So we are a number of task groups on NFPA 855. Um, so understanding what is being proposed and how we can prepare as a manufacturer. Uh, we also are members of um, UL 9540, which is the UL standard for battery energy storage systems. So um, there's not only the, the listing requirements of our system, but the code requirements that are driving uh, engineering changes into the system. Um, so just make sure we, we plan and we also uh, are engaging with the EPCs or our customers and explaining to them uh, what to be prepared for. You know, what may be assigned in the contract may be uh, an earlier code revision, um, but the pro product or site may not be online uh, in say four or five years from now. So the codes may evolve between the time the project was signed and when it's actually commissioned. Yeah, so Chris, yeah, absolutely. I think, mm -hmm. sorry, Michelle, I was just going to add a little bit to that. Uh, I, I think, you know, we, we try to actively engage the, the community, including HJs, including manufacturers, including EPC, to come up with the best practices. So when we say, yeah, we're looking at doing this, doesn't mean it's going to be in code because we obviously want that input. And you guys may look at it and go, that's nice, but it's not really practical uh, for us to implement. So is there a be better methodology to do so? So I think that's why it's so critical to have the whole industry involved in these discussions. Yeah, the, the key is to be transparent, to bring everyone to the table, let everyone yep. know that the technology, all the hazards, all the pros and cons. I t totally agree. Now. Chris, uh, we're, as we're wrapping up, I know we're sh running short on time. Uh, what's next for battery fire safety? What, what is Wartsola doing to be uh, competitive in the market in the coming years? Yeah, um, so for Wartsola, we um, are looking to enhance our existing GEMS um, EMS software offering. Um, so we've uh, initiated de developing a battery analytics platform uh, designed to deliver added value to the system owners um, via elevated performance monitoring, enhanced predictive maintenance, and more optimized battery usage. Um, so the initial offering would include uh, battery uh, performance metrics such as energy capacity, power output, um, temperature and voltage, uh, as well as the state of health indicator. And Paul, what's your take? What's the next the thing the next big thing in battery fire systems. You know, I, I like that idea of the battery analytics. I've heard some discussions on that, that that if you use the the right AI, I don't know what it is, that you probably can see some of these batteries heading south a month in advance. And can you get in there and deal with it before anything goes south? Now that, that assumes it's battery centric. I've heard the term I, I like to, um, is the battery the victim or the villain? So ultimately, unfortunately, a lot of battery fails in the world here. The batteries have been the victim, that we've got other things that happen. So can we get a better handle on our production processes? How do we make sure that we're not getting these third-party failures in the systems that's causing the batteries to fail and create the fire? Uh, one of the bigger things I see next for battery safety is we push the concept of large-scale fires. But honestly, we don't know what that means. The more you burn batteries, the more you ask questions. Do we populate the containers next to it? Do we run the containers next to it on BMS? Do we allow the batteries to be, um, the containers to be empty? Are we getting a true configuration? Because I'm of the opinion, you know, if one goes up, let it go. And if it doesn't propagate, you're done. You know, that's that's your safety requirements um, for batteries going down the road, how do we prove that? Uh, we had the, con some conditions the other day where the question says, okay, does it propagate? Well, what is propagate? Does it mean the batteries are engaged or does it mean that maybe we melted wires? Where do you go in between? So I think the industry has got to take a hard look at what propagation means and to what extent do we accept that okay, impingement? Is that propagation? Is that acceptable? 
Um, or do we say impingement or burning the cooling system up in the unit next to it, but no batteries? Is that fire? IFC says no fire. So right now, the industry, I think, has got some questions in front of them to figure out how to do that. Uh, Chris, to your point, we asked that question on UL 9540 the other day and got 20 different answers. So it tells me the industry needs to uh, to figure that out, that it, it's not clear. So what can we do to, to drive that question? I think that's going to be a big one. Let it fail. Uh, and how do we show safety concerns to the industry that, you know, just because something catches fire, how's this catch fire all the time? Um, it's not that it's not that significant of an event. Um, so that that's kind of my thoughts on it. Where where are we going? Uh, still looking at some hopefully some good technology. Can we differentiate between an electrolyte fire and an electrical fire? Because if we have an electrical, can we take care of it and get it away before the batteries get in trouble? I haven't seen that one yet. Hoping for it. Again, want a piece of that action if somebody comes up with it, but let me know. Yeah, definitely. And you mentioned UL 9540A. That is also going through a revision cycle, last I heard. So there, that delta between codes and technologies is slowly closing. And hopefully in the, in the near future, we'll see that gap close. Uh, Paul, I know this is a global market. Chris, we're, uh, as Wartilla, we're in the global field. What are the thoughts on ownership of equipment from overseas? Chris, I'll ask you first. Yeah, so um, you know, when you look at these systems um, from a fire detection standpoint, you can have, um, say, a fire panel that is sourced locally, say, in Asia. Uh, it's delivered on site, and uh, there's no system oh so there's no fire alarm vendor um, that may have a training or experience with these fire panels so it's always recommended um, to engage at the site level uh, with a fire alarm vendor uh, what their recommendations are uh, and ensuring that the system can be maintained uh, so from Wartzilla uh, we took the steps to uh, look at a global, let's say, product offering. So we have a system dedicated to, say, the uh, Americas market. Um, there's a separate system that's for Australia and another system for, say, UK and Europe. Um, but it's always recommended to ensure that when systems are built or from a manufacturer, that equipment can also be serviced locally uh, and maintained according to the relevant fire codes. Yeah, yeah, good point, Chris. And I've been struggling with that a little bit because I, I had a manufacturer that sold 5,000 panels into Asian market and they all showed up in the U.S. and that manufacturer had no idea that those panels were coming back to the U.S. So the, the, the question is, okay, who owns them? Who's got warranty? What if they're not programmed right? And sometimes you get vendors in the U.S. that are going, hey, I didn't sell that equipment. I'm not going to take liability and responsibility because that ownership, whoever touches it last has ownership. And if you know, a million dollar sale was made on it and that guy's getting $10,000, why should he take that risk? So it is it is something good to look at that supply chain and figure that out. Uh, you kind of mentioned service a little bit. So that's something I think is coming in the code is what is the inspection and testing after it's commissioned? Uh, because this is these are big fire alarm systems. When you look at a place that's got 100 panels on it, that's a pretty significant inspection requirement. When you've got exhausting systems, that's pretty significant under NFP 69. So I think those that back end is going to be critical going down the road. How are we maintaining these systems to ensure that all of our safety systems are still functioning? Absolutely. And uh, before we head into the Q&A session, uh, Paul, final question for you. What do you the companies like Warsaw are needing to do further to drive that energy transition forward safely. Safely. I, you know, there's a lot of engagement in the industry and I think we're fractured at the moment when you look at comp, uh, organizations like CISA in California, American Clean Power for the U.S. There's a number of organizations that I think if we can work together to come up with a cohesive discussion, presentation to the marketplace, to the, the U.S., because batteries are here. I mean, everybody wants the clean energy. 
So they recognize that piece of it, but they're a little bit of that NIMBY, not in my backyard type approach. So how do we cohesively communicate to the marketplace that this information, instead of the, you know, the website saying, okay, we're going to kill every dog within a three mile radius every time a battery fails. And that stuff is in the is in the uh, the public domain. How do we get it out? How do we make a better argument, hearts and minds, versus a technical argument to the public that this is not the boogeyman that it gets made out to be when you go to a public hearing? So I think we all got that responsibility to help work through that difficulty in the marketplace. And much as we can, you know, I I, I would help that. If anybody wants to engage, let me know. Absolutely. And uh, with that, let's begin the Q&A session. Uh, so we have our first question. Thermal runaway is probably the worst event for ESS as it may last hours with several self reignitions. Is there a way to detect gases caused by the very first stages of thermal runaway and prevent it? Chris, uh, you, you want to go first? Yeah. So, um... Typically, most systems uh, use a, say, unit level uh, gas detection device. Um, so that will, obviously, when the, the cells begin to vent, that uh, venting will occur, uh, say, in the module level and released into the, the unit level. Um, additionally, there are a number of, say, newer um, manufacturers systems that, um, say, maybe can detect that early stage thermal runaway. Um, so I think like a lion tamer system. Um, but um, in our experience, at least, you know, once that thermal runaway starts, um, it's not possible, say, to, to stop it. Um, so, we, but the industry is definitely looking at how can we detect sooner and, and stop sooner. Yeah, I, I, we try to differentiate between thermal runaway and propagation. So thermal runaway internal to a cell, you can't stop it. It's going to proceed to failure, through failure. But can we stop it from propagating to the next battery, the next module, the next container, whatever the, the mitigation strategy may be in there? So if there's some if there's some internal failure modes and we can take it off load, theoretically, if it's not gone into thermal runaway, we can say that um, taking it off low will cool that battery down. It's kind of think about your phone, it gets a little hot. There is a BMS in your phone. You take it off the charger, you set it down, it cools back down. So that's the, the core concept between taking it off load and then early. Now, if the battery's been damaged for whatever reason, there's a voltage surge, there's a overheating condition, something that's damaged, it's going to propagate. So how do we keep it? limited when you look at lfp traditionally it doesn't propagate very well traditionally it does not catch fire but it does produce gas so we deal with the gas situation and hopefully not the fire situation hopefully that answered that question yep and another similar question um, what about hydrogen detection system outdoors what are the recommendations there I, I don't see a whole lot of uh, need for it outdoors just because of hydrogen is so uh, light that it's going to dissipate very quickly. You're not going to really see it in any distance. Um, and if you're not in the right direction or have your gas detection where it should, where it potentially could pick up the leak, you're never going to see it. So I think, I think hydrogen really needs to stay indoors. Okay. And Chris, from an integrative perspective, we place hydrogen detectors out outside? Not at this time. So we, we just uh, have a in-unit um, gas detection. Okay. Let's shift more towards NSPA and UL 9548. So we got some questions regarding that. Uh, first one, can NSPA 855 requirement be met with a technology that is not UL listed? Do R&D projects have any expectations? So uh, I can I can answer that. So yeah. uh, in NFPA 55, uh, I think it's really right at the very beginning of the standard um, equivalency. So uh, nothing in the standard is meant to uh, prevent the use of systems, methods, or devices uh, that can meet the desired outcome. So um, 
it's just really uh, working with the AHJ, um, showing them the data. Uh, maybe you may need a independent uh, FPE third party review, uh, including an HMA to, to validate what those systems are uh, and get acceptance from the, the local AHJ. And I think that it's called equivalency uh, within the, the code. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Obviously, if you can get it listed, it makes your life a lot easier. If you can meet 9540 coming out of the factory, it makes your life easier. Um, but that's not always feasible due to supply chain issues, uh, manufacturing issues. There's just a lot of things that play into that. But 9540 is a core tenant of 855. Now, we are working through to find some ways to do better equivalency and allow the industry, if they've got supply chain issues, a big part of that has to do with factory and quality control. So where, do, where does that listing come from under 9540? But uh, there are ways to do it, but you are better if you can show that we are providing a listed product. Example, Europe, you know, if you've got an EN listing, can, it, it, can we show equivalency to UL? That makes it easy. If there's no listings whatsoever, it makes it really hard. Michelle, we lost you. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, next question is on UL 9540A. Will it take into account about fire propagation under different wind conditions? That's also going through a revision cycle, so if you folks have any idea about that. Yeah, at least from, from my experience working on the task group, uh, we are not looking at, say, different wind conditions. Um, I think the standard has a certain wind criteria. Um, the idea there, obviously, is the test is repeatable, uh, so you don't want to have, say, varying wind conditions between different manufacturing tests. Um, but we are looking at um, what can potentially be the worst case um, scenario. So currently today you have just, um, say, in a module level test, uh, a requirement to propagate to adjacent cells, uh, but they also are looking at, uh, okay, a worst case, what happens if you propagate through the say entire module? Uh, that information can then be passed on to a unit level test or an installation level test to do a reasonably worst case um, scenario where uh, there could be flaming or uh, defecation hazards. Yeah, I'm, I look at a cell level test to give me gas production at a most conservative. I look at module level to give me propagation speeds for again, gas production. Um, I don't really have a whole lot of use as an FPE for a unit level test. It doesn't tell me a whole lot. It tends to perform better. And it, it's not as conservative as using the other levels. We are looking at separating out the 9540A from a large scale test. And what should a large scale test do to talk about fire propagation? There is some discussion under 9540A to should we do an explosion test? Um, both UL and A55 are talking about a piloted ignition test um, for fire, which gets outside of what 9540A is doing at the moment. Um, and that's why we're, we're separating it because the 9540A may say we don't get any propagation, which is great, but in real world, we've seen propagation. So what? why are we getting the difference? So that's where the large scale test is, assume a complete failure light it up, let it go. But ultimately we should be doing a test that shows our mitigation measures are working, a safety test. You know, we've, we've applied all this technology to it to keep it from propagating. Shouldn't we be testing that? So that adds money, it adds cost, it adds time, but fundamentally don't we want to show the market that our safety systems function the way they're intended? Great, thank you. Uh, now, Another follow-up question, we're going to switch away from standards and code, is regarding suppression systems. And we talked about that a little bit in this webinar. But we have a, a participant asking if direct integration of Novec 1230 into the battery pack, is it allowed? Is it useful uh, since it establishes a direct connection with the battery pack? I, first. Yeah, I can I can take that one. Um, I'm a big fan of module level application. I mean, obviously, if we can hit it early, 
then it works. Uh, the The issue with that system, and I'm fine with it. I've seen it. I know what you guys are talking about. It does put out, a, you know, a single cell or double cell uh, fire. So if we're failing at that level, it works very well. There is not good this equivalency. Um, what what standard? Because it doesn't meet the suppression standard 2001 for suppression. So what standard are you installing it to? And the code doesn't have a good handle on that. Are we using uh, UL listed 864 fire components to trip it? Are we using pressure vessel ASME standards because we do have pressure pipe? It needs to be manufactured to a standard. And right now the code doesn't have a good direction to tell you what that standard should be. But all in all, I, I'm fine. There are a number of manufacturers that do modules, cell level application. And I think there's there's good value in that. Chris, from an integrator's perspective, do we have Nova Tool 30 or another clean agent system? As a manufacturer, we do not incorporate this into our system. That's uh, prevalently uh, or more prevalent on an NMC battery type um, using yeah. LFP. Uh, we do not need a, uh, in, say a suppression system to pass the unit level testing of 9540A. Um, I do know that uh, the proposed revisions for UL9540 uh, do include some verbiage related to these um, suppression or extinguishing systems. Uh, I believe they um, recommend that, say, the piping and tubing um, should be in accordance with ASME B31.1. Um, and there's also some additional um, uh, requirements for the, say, pressure regulators, solenoid valves, and how they should be listed or compliant to. So uh, I don't believe that is released quite yet, um, but uh, that will be added uh, into 9540 listing uh, as well as the appendix uh, G for clean agent direct injection uh, battery rack cooling systems. Great, and uh, I do wanna take note of the time, it's 11.58. Uh, let's do one last question. This is a pretty good one, I know we're seeing other integrators come out with this product, but what is your view of back-to-back -back container placement, multiple double stack configurations? Is that the industry standard going forward? Uh, what is the spacing requirements for, for that in your perspective? Chris, you want that one? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the, it's best uh, to do a, say, a performance-based analysis, say a heat flux analysis uh, with the systems to validate that and follow it up with uh, large-scale fire testing. So a performance-based analysis should give a good indication would the cells or modules in the adjacent units um, reach a, a risk of, say, cell venting or thermal runaway? Uh, and then always best uh, for validation at that uh, full-scale fire testing uh, to ensure that um, you can replicate and validate that performance-based analysis. Yeah, I, I think that's a big one, Chris. And, and, you know, with fire testing, I've seen a full unit fully engaged and six inches away. We didn't damage the batteries. So that's ideal. Uh, it is interesting from a stacking standpoint, I get that request more and more often. Can we put another container on top? And, and honestly, I don't know. Um, I think we put some language in the code that says, uh, just as long as you show the tested configuration, if you test it that way and it works, then you should be able to utilize that configuration in the field. Thank you so much, Paul and Chris. Uh, I know we've reached the end of our time for this webinar. Uh, we have several questions that we couldn't answer, unfortunately, but stay tuned for the next one. And uh, in the meantime, I'd love to thank you both, Paul and Chris, for joining this webinar and ATA for having this platform for this. To stay up to date with Wardzilla and Hiller companies, do follow us on LinkedIn. Uh, we, I'm sure both of us uh, have a pretty heavy presence on there. Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff that we repost and post, so do follow us there. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have a great